Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to First Church of Christ Islands, Cleveland. We're giving a lecture this afternoon, which is titled Giving Finding Health, Hope for All Mankind. And joy. And joy. Finding health, hope, joy for all. And the lecture is being given by Stephen Salt who is a member of the uh, Christian Science Board of Lectureship. Uh, Stephen is a native of Columbus, Ohio. He was born and grew up there, uh, worked for the family business, which was a hardware store, up until uh, he devoted himself full-time to the practice of he is teaching others how to heal as well. And in that same year, he was appointed as Committee on Publication for the State of Ohio. Uh, that is a position that requires the, the COP, Committee on Publication, to uh, deal with the public, uh, such as legislators, clergy, and other members of the public in answering their questions uh, representing Christian science. So uh, Stephen has been uh, doing this for quite a while, and then a couple of years ago, he moved to St. Louis and uh, began uh, his his tour as a uh, member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship. He's married to his high school sweetheart, Crystal, and he has two sons, three grandsons, and lots of hobbies. So I would ask you to join me in welcoming Steve today. And we're looking forward to a very good lecture. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. It's good to be in Cleveland. I haven't been here in several years. Can everybody hear me in the back OK? OK, good. Well, we are going to talk a little bit about joy, health, and hope. Why those three? interesting combination. Certainly, though, every one of those words or concepts are important to humanity. They happen to come from a line in the Christian Science Hymnal, which bef right before that it says, in him, God, we find joy, health, hope for all mankind. Joy. In thinking about joy and, and what I wanted to talk about, joy to me speaks about our outlook on life and how we respond to the things going on around us. It really has to do with our, our mental attitude, how, how this, this idea of mental wholeness, you could say mental health. So I want to touch on mental health today. That second word, health, speaks to our physical well-being. We all desire to thrive, to feel whole, complete, to feel good every day. And we want a consistent sense of that. Last couple of years, that might seem hard to come by because of all the news about pandemics that we've heard. And Perhaps maybe you've had a personal challenge. That last word, hope, to me that represents our anticipation of good, the expectation that we're okay. Again, looking at the world through the lens of the media, sometimes you have to wonder. So I hope that if you get anything out of today's talk, it's that you come to the realization, if you haven't already, that the good that we want in our lives, the good that our hearts yearn for, that good is irrepressible. And it's irrepressible because good is God. Good isn't something that we have to self-generate. It's God 
generated. Now, in thinking about God, a lot of different ideas about what God is, I'm going to be speaking about how I view God as life giver. When I think about God, I think about truth. Not just any truth, but the truth. The truth that reveals reality for us. What, what really undergirds everything. When I think about God, I have to think about love. God as father, mother. God as always there for us. Always comforting us, always caring for us. Not a God that we have to go find, but a God that's ever present. And one other word that I like to think about when I think about God is principle. Now that's a big word, but basically by that what I mean is the laws that make good substantial in our lives. Those very laws of the universe that unify, that brings harmony into our lives. Harmony within our own being, harmony with our neighbors, harmony with God. And if we're looking for that good, looking for that harmony, as we come to understand this universality of God's goodness, it's something that we can witness every day. For example, how many of you heard the dawn chorus this morning? <laughs> the dawn chorus, that's that symphony of bird song that happens every morning, at least an hour before the sun rises. And lasts usually about an hour afterwards. That's a time when the birds are singing really crisp and clear and loud. They're saying to the world, here I am world. Here's where I live. Here's my song. They're heralding a new day, but they're also heralding their identity. Why do birds sing? Where did they learn that? Birds are just being birds. It's a natural thing for them. And we too, we have a song. You ever think about that? When I go out in the morning to listen to the birds, sometimes I even have an occasion to hear the hum of a hummingbird. In fact, just a couple days ago, there was two of them, just no farther than me and you, just sitting there, first looking at me, and I said hello, and then looking at each other, and they took off. But as we start to look in our lives for this sense of harmony, this, this unison, this, this unity, we're going to discover a lot about God's creation and our part in it. When we think about joy, that's something else that I just briefly want to define how I look at joy. Yes, there are the more overt examples of when we hear about or see joy, maybe it's, it's, it's the Browns winning a football game or, or the Guardians going for the pennant. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes it could be something like a simple walk in the park. My wife, Crystal, and I this morning went to the Cuyahoga National Park and, and walked the, the footpath next to the canal and, and looked at the Brandywine Falls and just how beautiful that was. It brought, brought us joy. But joy isn't just something that happens to us when something pleasant is going on in our lives. Joy is something that's built in. It's a spiritual quality that we all have, even if sometimes we're challenged. When I think about joy, I'm thinking about 
maybe just a deep sense of gratitude for the day, for the sunshine, for the warm weather. Gratitude to God for revealing something new in my thought. Maybe it can be this, this aha kind of experience. Maybe it's just a deep-seated sense of peace that, yeah, I'm okay. Everything's okay. That said, we know that there can be challenging times for our well-being, mental, physical, our hopes. Sure. I always like to share uh, a line from a children's book. Maybe you wrote, read it to a child at one time. The book's called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Do you ever have one of those? Here, here's a line at the end of the day. It's, it, the book is written with a sense of humor, of course. And, and oftentimes humor is, is not a part of our day. But here it just says, when I went uh, to bed, this is uh, Alexander talking. When I went to bed, Nick took back the pillow he said I could keep. And the Mickey Mouse nightlight burned out and I bit my tongue. The cat wants to sleep with Anthony, not with me. It has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Well, Alexander's terrible day was really more about his reaction to the things that happened to him that day. And one of the things I want to share with you today, now this isn't Steve's personal philosophy, this is Christian science. Christian science explains the incredible good going on. The incredible good endowed by God for each of us and how we have the, the fortitude, the ability, the, the power to respond in things in a loving way, in a truthful way. We can look at life so much different when we think out from God. Now, yes, there could be many things that approach our day which challenges our, 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 our wellness. Maybe it's something going on right today, an in-your-face kind of thing, something going on at work or at home. Maybe there's a health issue. There's also things that happened in the past. Something that seems to have molded us and shaped us into how we think about things today. Also, there's that future thing. What if? Yes, but... You know, what might happen? Am I going to be okay? Is my family going to be okay? Certainly, these crop up all the time. Sometimes, though, this sense of, of mental well-being, physical health, sometimes we just don't feel happy for no apparent reason whatsoever. And that's the first story I want to share with you, something that happened to me uh, a while back. All of a sudden, I noticed that I wasn't smiling too much. There wasn't the normal kick in my step. Things seemed a little bit down, and I didn't know why. I mean, if you looked at the surface of things, everything was fine. I have a wonderful family. I have, I'm married to my high school sweetheart, who was right over there, still with me. I had a wonderful son, a great job. I worked with my dad in the hardware store. I volunteered in the community. I did work at the church. I mean, I was doing everything right. But there was a disconnect. 
I didn't feel alive. I didn't feel like I was connected at some level. Now, I never had it diagnosed. That's just not something that I would think of doing. But I suppose you could call it depression. In any case, as I started to recognize, you know, this can't be right. I mean, and it's hard to recognize that in yourself sometimes. But I just wasn't responding the way I should to the things going on around me that I wasn't responding in a way that was productive or healthy. So I didn't do anything right off the bat about it. Because again, I just thought, well, this must be life. I did lean into my work a little bit more because I did like to work and, and work kept me occupied. But that didn't help. I always kept coming back to the sense of emptiness. When, when you're depressed, there's a, a sense of, of, of loneliness and isolation even with people around you. So I knew I had to do something about it. And that's when I turned to my Bible. Now I'd grown up in Christian Science Sunday School, and I knew that the Bible was full of accounts of how when something bad was going on, as an individual or group turned to God, that good things started to happen and the bad dissipated. It's just on the most fundamental level of what the Bible's about. It, it provides that little inspiration and the accounts of how God's presence can heal anything. Whether we're talking about mental issues, physical issues, something to do with something we need. So I started reading the Bible. At the same time, because I am a Christian scientist, I also was reading from Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, a book written by Mary Baker Eddy, to help explain some of the concepts in the Bible. Science and Health brings some of those long-told stories in the Bible, they bring them into the present. They make the truths that the Bible speaks about applicable to today. So I was starting to look into both of those books and at the same time pray. We'll talk about prayer in just a little bit. The prayer for me was getting me to focus not on the problem, but on God, on good. Sometimes we just need that little kick in the pants and that's what prayer helped me. It provided me with that space I needed to to commune with this idea of infinite goodness. One of the things that I read about in the Bible is something that's in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Isaiah. And God here is, is just speaking about what it means to be God and how it relates to each of us. The passage goes, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Were you aware of those trees clapping their hands for you this morning? I wasn't, not then. But I love that thought, that that divine intelligence, that divine good is always there if we're looking for it. Just like I found it in the birds or in the walk in the, uh, in the park today. As I was thinking out more from God's perspective, not 
some lonely poor me perspective, but how does God view his universe? How does mind see creation? How does love view everything? It's through that lens that I started to feel a spark, feel a little bit more energized, if you will. It took a couple months, but in my study of the Bible and science and health, in my prayers, and in applying some of what I was learning, it really turned the corner for me. One of the things that my dad shared with me, not knowingly, but something I learned from him, when we were working together in the hardware store, dad would always greet the customer with, how's life treating you? That's a great way to engage with someone. I mean, it was a neighborhood hardware store. We knew everybody that came into the store. And if you were a stranger, you were going to be a stranger for very long. But Dad would go up and, and just, you know, how, how do you talk to someone? But hey, how is life treating you? And then they would probably share something together. Well, working there, I, I picked that up too. I might not have been as forthright as my dad initially. I might have been a little more reserved, but I still wanted to get to know the person and why are you in the hardware store today? What, what problem can I help you solve? Eventually, I adopted that phrase to, how are you treating life? It's a big difference there. And, and how's life treating you? Sometimes we're thinking about, well, we just have to go with it, right? Whatever's happening, good or bad, you know, we have to go with the flow. But when you come to think about it, I mean, in, in the first chapter of Genesis in the Bible, it talks about God giving man dominion. Well, to me, part of that meant, well, I have control over how I think about things, how I view life, how I respond to both the good and the bad things that happen to me. And so in thinking about, well, how are you treating life? I was starting to recognize that, you know, I could think about things not from what I like to call the basement thinking, but from the penthouse thought, you know, where God is. Think about more about how can I respond to this specific situation with a sense of compassion and love, just like Christ Jesus taught us. So, what I, like I said, it, it, it took a while, a couple months, but what I came to understand was that I wasn't just engaging in positive thinking. This was all the result of relying on my father, mother, my God, my, my true love, that guided me out of this seeming dark place that I was in to where I felt, you know, there was a kick in my step. I, I was rejoicing in life. One of the things that I also held on to along with that Bible passage about going forth in joy was something else that I read in Science and Health. The, the idea was basically, and I, I kept repeating this, not just as a mantra, but this is my truth. Sorrow is not the master of joy. That's sometimes hard to swallow because in this world, sometimes sorrow seems to be outmaneuvering joy. It seems to be stronger than that sense of happiness that we're pursuing. That, that thought, sorrow is not the master of joy, is something that's found in science and health. 
It's in the chapter called Science of Being. And it simply says this, that this is the doctrine of Christian science. The divine love, God, cannot be deprived of its manifestation or object. That's us. That joy cannot be turned into sorrow, for sorrow is not the master of joy. Mary Baker Eddy wrote those words over a century ago. If you're not familiar with Mrs. Eddy, she founded the Christian Science Church. She's the discoverer of Christian science. This was a fascinating lady. And she was living at a time when there were a lot of misogynistic attitudes out there. Mrs. Eddy had a, a, what you might consider a rough start in life. There were several times in her life when she didn't even have a roof over her head and had to rely on the kindness of friends just to have a place to live. Later in life after her discovery, she accomplished quite a bit, including founding a publishing society, uh, starting the Christian Science Monitor. And if you're not familiar with the Monitor, you might go to Christian Science, or excuse me, csmonitor.com and take a look at that publication. In, a, in an era where we hear a lot about news avoidance, the news is just so bad I don't want to hear anything, you'll find that if you go to the Monitor, there they have constructive healing journalism going on. They're going to give you the, 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 the true report, but they're going to do it in a way that lifts up rather than tears down. So, you know, if you don't, if you're not familiar with the monitor, take a look at that. Anyway, she founded that paper. Here's a woman who had so many difficulties in her early life and then was met with these attitudes. You know, she's a woman, what could she do? What can she know in her later life? So when she's saying something like, sorrow is not a master of joy, she's giving us a great big truth here for all of us, but she's also speaking from her heart. This is her experience. She knew through her discovery of science, Christian science, that we do have a lot more control, dominion in our lives than we're led, led to believe. I think that's one of the reasons why she termed this discovery Christian science. The Christian part, of course, speaks to love. It speaks to God. But it also speaks to the founding of truth. What is it that makes things work? Why are, you know, what is life all about? Science is also looking for truth, what makes things tick, looking underneath the facade of, of, of matter to see what makes things go. So yeah, science is coming at it from a slightly different angle than Christian science, but it's still basically this idea that what is it that reveals reality? What is it that makes things go? In Science and Health, Mrs. Eddy points to Jesus. Well, a lot, but what I'm thinking here is, in again, the chapter on science of being, she talks about Jesus of Nazareth was the most scientific man that ever trod the globe. He plunged beneath the material surface of things and found the spiritual cause. It's just so interesting that as we have this deep desire to feel God's goodness, to 
feel whole mentally, physically, in any way, that she found the answer by looking at Christ's teachings and seeing how we can utilize those same concepts today in healing the way Christ Jesus did. Christ, that ever-present manifestation of the divine, and, and Jesus, the highest human conception of that divine. What a wonderful treat that is. What, what inspiration. I mean, when we think about Christ Jesus as you know, salvation as, as the example of the way show up. She discovered that everything that he showed us, showed the world through his love, through his humility, through his strength, his power. These are all concepts that are just as alive and applicable today as they ever have been. That's why it's Christian science, something that's learnable, something that's applicable, something that is provable every day in our lives. And in thinking about God's goodness, which is kind of the, the baseline theme of, of my talk today, that ever-present goodness, she said something else in one of her other writings. She said, God's goodness reveals another scene and another self, seemingly rolled up in shades, but brought to light by the evolutions of advancing thought. Another scene, another self, what is she talking about? Well, this is where identity comes in and how we think about ourselves. What makes you, you, and me, me? What's the difference? Well, that identity is so important, but we need to expand it just beyond the, the, the physical, right? I mean, I know that the world likes to look at us and evaluate us and number us from physical characteristics. If you get out your ID card, you get out your driver's license, it's going to give you the height and it's going to give you the weight and it's going to give you the hair color and the eye color. But is that you? If I were to ask you to share with me just a couple uh, ideas about your best friend or loved one, you're going to give me some spirit, what I call spiritual qualities. Sometimes I call them priceless attributes. Maybe he or she is vivacious, or maybe they're very quiet. Maybe they're very studious, or maybe they just are a house on fire. We all have these wonderful qualities that we don't think about very often. We're pretty concerned with the body. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm speaking generally here. I'm not talking about any one of us specifically, but we're so entertained by, by the physicality that we forget about us, who we are. That's the other self that Eddie's talking about. As we become more familiar with that spiritual identity, it allows us to be more authentic. We don't have to go copying somebody else. Oh, I like how that person looks, I'm gonna copy that, or I like what that person believes, I'm gonna copy that. That's not how you find joy, well-being, health. You find it in yourself. It's God put it there. The same way that birds who just sing because that's what they do, 
we have an infinite number of qualities that we want to be aware of. I made a list once of those spiritual qualities. I'm only up to like 1,200. I wrote an article about it once. I ran out of words. So I'm gonna have to start learning some other languages. But just to think about these qualities, maybe you think you don't have some of them, maybe, but you admire them in somebody else. You have everything that God gave you. You are a complete package. When God put a stamp of approval on each and every one of us, he said, this is good. I like what I've done. We have to have hope in that. We have to have faith in that. We have to know what those qualities are. One of the things that I've learned in my life experience is thinking about what qualities I attract in my life. Because if I'm constantly looking at something not so good, that's usually what I bring out in life. Put it in another way, when my wife and I and my son moved to St. Louis just a couple years ago, we bought this nice house in a nice neighborhood, but it was winter time, the grass was all brown, no, no leaves on the trees, so we didn't know what we had. House was nice. When spring came, yeah, there was green on the trees and the grass greened up. But that was it. There's nothing wrong with green, but we wanted to express more of the fullness of God's creation. My wife happens to be a master gardener. She knows a lot about plants and flowers. And so what did we do? We planted bulbs and flowering trees. We, we planted anything that would bloom throughout the year. So that when the next spring came, it had all of this beautiful color and texture. Why did we want that? Because it's reflective of, of, of God's creation. We don't live our life in black and white. We wanted to see the whole spectrum. Guess what happened when we did that, when we planted those things? All of a sudden, our little corner of heaven became the hubbub of all kinds of activity. We had birds, we had hummingbirds, we had butterflies, we had pollinators, bumblebees. We, I mean, just, they all started flocking. I mean, to us, that was just life exemplified. Reality. I mean, those, those critters had been there the whole time, but we were never aware of them. And as they came to our yard to be a part of all this color, it was just so, so wonderful. So when I, I'm talking about what are we attracting in our lives, we think about what is it that, that I'm expressing every day? What else can I express that will bring out more of God's joy? The joy that God has for us. The joy that God says, hey, you're going to walk forth in joy. Um, one of the things, as I talked about when I was dealing with my own problem, one of the things that I really worked on was my prayer. Prayer really gets us into sync with the divine and that divine goodness. Now, there are as many ways to pray as there are people in the universe, and, and that's, that's a good thing. We all are unique. We each pray in our own way. I mean, obviously there are some standard ways of praying. There's, you know, you can pray all day long, just like those birds that sing on the on the wind. We can be constantly thinking about the goodness of God's creation every step we take. It's something we can do. We can also, though, at times we have to go quiet, right? 
there's, there's times when we have to do the closet prayer, as the Bible would say. We really have to be quiet and still to feel that peace that is God's goodness. However we do it, the important thing about prayer to me is something that Christ Jesus taught us. You know, it's got to be based on love. Does this, is this a loving thought, a loving concept about me and my neighbor? He also taught us about humility. Humility is just taking a step back, not, not giving God your plan, but letting God give you his or her plan. Humility also speaks to the idea of, okay, you can stop talking now and you can start listening. I mean, it's okay to talk to God. We also have to listen with our heart. I'll give you an example. Uh, an acquaintance, a, a gentleman who happens to live on a different continent, got a call one day from his wife. The wife said, we're being evicted. Just like that, I mean, his He's having a normal life, he's got a good job, he's doing everything right, but they're being evicted. And when I talked to him, he said, yeah, my first thought was confusion and, and wonder and what's going on. But he never turned to anger, he never was upset. He was a Christian scientist. He understood, again, the control he had and how he would respond to something as bad as that sounded. I'm being evicted? On the way home, he got in his car. He had to go see what was going on. He had quite a, a, a trip to take. His workplace and his home were, were not too close together. During that trip, he prayed. Praying on the fly. What came to him in just the sense of, of reaching out to God, to God's goodness, what came to him was another phrase that's in the Christian Science Hymnal. Home is the consciousness of good. That simple. Home is the consciousness of good. And that's what he kept working with all the way home. Home is the consciousness of good. Rather than going down the possible future scenarios like we were talking about earlier, he just stood his ground right there in the moment, in the present. Good, home is, home is God's goodness ever present. It's not really a structure or address, but it's a state of mind. It's, it's, it's something that we're going to carry around with us forever and ever. So that was his prayer. It was a simple one, but he was very determined to stay there. Home is the consciousness of good. When he got home, he found that everything that he and his wife owned was out on the street. Not only that, but everyone in their apartment complex had also been evicted. They found out later that through some miscommunication, the courts in his town had, there had been some problem with the owner of the, of the building and everyone was to go and get out, but no one had ever told any of them. So there you have it. What do you do? There's your stuff laying there out of, exposed. Again, going back to this idea of God's goodness, rather than being upset, rather than being angry, he and his wife decided that they were gonna help the police in doing what it was their duty to do. 
which was to put all of the stuff out of the building and onto the street. He knew that as long as he was abiding by this goodness, the foundation of, of, of unity, of, of harmony, that he could not be harmed, his wife could not be harmed. So they helped with whatever they could do. It turns out that that night they did find a place to stay with a relative and within just a couple days, they found a new home to live in. All of this while he was doing that humble work, just like Jesus showed us. Don't rise or don't lower yourself to this idea of, of well, God's not going to be there for me in the future. Instead, he just focused on the moment. What good can I do right now? And the situation was resolved. I think it's that idea of harmony, even working with your enemies, so-called. It's something that Christ Jesus taught us. Christ Jesus gave us some wonderful instructions. The attitudes, commands, to really help us get through the tough times and for us to explore our own identity as the loved of God. I love that prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Just those two first words. Our Father. Our. That idea of inclusion. No matter what your job is, no matter what you're there to do. Father. That idea, again, of love. Just embracing us, no matter how difficult the situation seems to be. Those wonderful instructions, whether you're thinking about a Sermon on the Mount or, or the Beatitudes, as we live by them, practice them, love them, we do find things coming out of us that we might not have known were ever there. Some resourcefulness, certainly a sense of joy. Something that is attributed to Christ Jesus in the New Testament. This is the book of John. Jesus said, I loved you as the Father loved me. Now, remain in my love. I have obeyed my Father's commands, and I remain in his love. In the same way, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. I have told you these things so that you can have the same joy I have. And so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. That's Christ Jesus talking to us. We know what problems he faced, both in a collective way and personally. And he's talking about his joy and he giving it to us so that we might have the fullest possible joy. When I think about Christ Jesus, sometimes I have several analogies, but one that struck me when I was thinking about talking in, in this wonderful church today, uh, I was reminded of the, the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. I mean, I listened to the Symphony Orchestra as a kid. I had a lot of their records. And I think about the first chair. I think about Christ Jesus as kind of fulfilling that role of the first chair. If everybody in that orchestra would tune to the guy next to them, you'd have a pretty interesting sound. It wouldn't be harmonic because everyone has just a slightly different variation. By the time you got around to the other side, 
you probably are being close to a different note. But that's why they have the first chair. Everyone listens to that note. That's how they tune their instrument. As we listen to that Christ truth, as we obey those Christ teachings, as we live our life in the love and humility that Christ Jesus taught us, we too find harmony. And that harmony can speak to anything, whether it's a mental health issue, finding a centeredness in your life, whether it's a physical issue, where we're really searching to feel the oneness of God in our soul and body. As we tune to that, we find, we'll find so many examples of God being ever present right here with us. I've talked so far about my mental health and this gentleman who found himself homeless. Next, I'd like to uh, share with you the story of a friend. This, this is the physical uh, health uh, that I was talking about at the beginning of our talk. My friend wasn't quite feeling the harmony of life. He, at the, at the time, well, I'll just tell you the story. I got a call from my friend's wife. She had to leave a message on my phone. I wasn't available at that moment. And she simply said, my friend was lying prone on the ground, unconscious because of a fall and an ambulance had been called. So she's calling me because I'm a Christian science practitioner. I pray to help those with whatever the problem seems to be at the moment. She was also calling because I was a friend. So with that little information, I started to pray. What do you pray about when that's the news you have? Well, Again, kind of going along with what we've been talking about today. I'm not going to start with the problem. We're not going to go to the, down the road of what if or why. We're just going to stay focused on the moment. I knew a lot of those spiritual qualities that my friend exuded. I wasn't going to focus on the body. I was really good to think about his identity as a child of God. Some of those wonderful qualities that he expresses, that I knew him to be. So I was just reaching out to God and knowing that, you know, even if he's fallen off of a roof, none of those qualities can be smushed or broken. They're spiritual. God's ideas can't run into each other. They blend harmoniously together. So this was the beginning of my, of my prayer. I did get a phone call later, giving me a little bit more detail about what had happened. My friend was actually on a, on a love mission. He was out on the roof of his workshop trying to trim some branches from a tree because of a storm that was coming which in the past, that same tree had knocked out the power to the whole neighborhood. And he didn't want that to happen. So he was out there trimming the branches. He came into contact with a power line. The authorities say that 17,000 volts of electricity had passed through him. And so it had blown him right off the roof. And so he was lying unconscious on the ground. They had taken him to the hospital where the, the doctors were concerned about many things. The first thing they had done is they had to do a lot of stitching, sewing some things. He also had broken vertebrae in his neck. 
And at that moment, he was in the burn unit because of burns on his body, because of the electricity that had passed through him. So, okay, that, that's more of the story of the why, but I continued in my own prayer to recognize that we don't have to accept these conditions, so-called, as it relates to our well-being. My friend's health, his wholeness, is the result of his creator, God, who is ever-present. Can, that cannot be changed. It was in just a couple days that my friend, all of a sudden, found himself sitting up in bed. This was something that was unusual. It was not expected. My friend was supposed to be laid out for a long time. But there he was, sitting up. And he took that kind of, he was started to think about, you know, he had grown up in Christian science. He knew about some of these spiritual qualities that I was focusing on. He knew that he too had that dominion to where he could see himself as God always sees him. Perfect, pure, in perfect harmony, all body parts in unison. As he and I were praying, he thought to himself, you know, I would really like to go home. He thought that he could do his own prayer work better there. And why not? Well, I mean, those at the hospital would rather he not. But he did discharge himself with the deepest sense of gratitude. I mean, they had shown a lot of love, a lot of expertise and skill, but he understood that his health wasn't in the hospital. It wasn't in the doctors. It wasn't in the stitches. His health His wholeness is the result of God. So he did go home. And it was a very short time later that he decided, you know, I've got to get up and get going. He, he likes to work. He's a handyman. He decided to go and help a, a relative in another town who was rehabbing a house at the time. So he spent the next week just rejoicing that he could go out and help somebody. Do something that he was an expert at. Came home. We're still praying. We're still looking at his identity from a more godlike viewpoint. We were still working on a couple things. And then my friend decided, well, you can go back to work. Besides being a handyman, he's also a stagehand at a local theater. And they needed him. So he decides, well, I'm going to go, go do what I'm built to do. And of course, if you know anything about a stagehand, that is some heavy work. You know, moving equipment, scenery, all that kind of thing. Takes some mental acuity, organizing things. He spent the day setting up for a concert. At the end of the day, he got to see the concert. He's 20 feet away from Paul McCartney. It's a Paul McCartney concert. Paul McCartney is there singing, Hey Jude. And if you know the song to Hey Jude, Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take that sad song and make it better. He's going there that far away from Paul McCartney, going, yeah, it doesn't get any better than this. Now, of course, 
part of that was, yeah, I'm standing next to Paul McCartney, but what he was saying in his heart and what he relayed to me was, I'm healed. Whatever had transpired, whatever the effects had been, were gone. He was expressing his harmony, his, his oneness with God. And he attributes that to what he knows about Christian science. It's what he knows about Christian science that gives him this wonderful perspective about what God is and his relationship to God. Um, so let's just, for, for just a second, I, we're running out of time here, but let's, let's talk about healing for just a minute. What happened? When you think about healing, you first want to start with, as I've mentioned, start with God, okay? Let's, let's start with, what, what's the blueprint? It doesn't start with a broken you, or a hurtful you, or a sad you. It starts with the you that God made. Think out from God. Think out from God's goodness. Even when a challenge is there, just remind yourself that God is all. God is everything. That means good is all. And I can experience that right now. Think about the nature of bad things. Bad things as explained in science, are really just the belief that good is absent. And so, just like the Bible stories show, and, and, and thousands of, of healings uh, that have been documented uh, in the Christian Science periodicals, that as we turn to God and God's viewpoint of life, its wholeness, its harmony, its goodness. The bad necessarily has to go. They can't, good and bad can't grow together. It's like light and dark. You have any light at all, the dark has to go. So think out from God's goodness, just remember, Evil or bad isn't as powerful as it seems. Think about your identity when it comes to healing. Don't accept the idea of whatever the problem is, that this is you. How does God see you? Think about... Think about... the natural progression that is going on in our experiencing in life. I usually relate this concept to something I remember as a child. When growing up in Columbus, Ohio, we had one skyscraper, the Lovec Lincoln Tower. It had been there since the 30s. All of a sudden, two more were built. There were three skyscrapers. And I'm going, this is so cool. Someday, this is all going to stop. And we'll be able to rest and think about, isn't this town great? Back then, Columbus had a little bit of a cow town mentality, and, and they didn't like it. Well, as I came to find out in my more mature years, that doesn't, there's no stopping progress. Progress keeps, is moving forward. And there's a progress, there's a law of progress as it relates to us and God, that we're always experiencing more of our identity. That, that, that hidden self that, that Eddie was talking about. There's a natural progression that we're all a part of. Think about that when you think about healing. We're not stuck 
in some place and time or on some dirt ball called Earth. We are actually part of this momentum, this force, this power called God. We're his expression, we're his goodness, we're his loved. As we think that way, then more evidence of that goodness becomes evident, whether it's birds singing or whether it's something you discover about your own innate goodness, your own innate harmony. So let, let, me, let me wrap up. Um, joy, our, 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 our mental fortitude, health, physical well-being, our expectation of good. These are all things that are elemental to our being. Thank you, God. Thanks to love's persistent presence, we can rely on God's goodness especially in times of need. We can rely on it at all times, but when you find yourself in a tough spot, whatever that situation is, we can find, we can trust that goodness to be there. As we think about God as infinite good, and we see ourselves as part of that goodness, we are God's goodness. Something that Paul writes in the Bible. Paul is my Bible hero. He started off with just a real chip on his shoulder. He was just seemed to be the antagonist to everything good. And yet, when he found humility through Christ, he did a 180 and became the most prolific Christian healer of all times. Something he writes, this is in Philippians in the New Testament. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. It is right for me to feel this way about you, all of you, since I have you in my heart. Think about what's in your heart. Think about what you can attract that will allow that sense of stability and calmness and joy and exhilaration and thriving and all of that. It's all there. What can I do to bring that alive? As we come to understand that God cannot abandon us, that God is ever present, then we too can feel God's presence. We're not talking about just knowing about God, it's being with God, feeling God, loving that good. That is the essence of our very being. As we think about our spiritual identity in relation to God, then don't be surprised when you go out the door. You might hear those trees clapping for you. Acknowledge that. Express a little gratitude for that. Whatever good you become aware of, thank God for that. You might even hear that, that hum of, of harmony. I thank everyone for being here today on this beautiful day. I hope you get to go outside and enjoy it as you listen to the trees. If you need a copy of Science and Health, the book that I've been talking about along with the Bible, there in the reading room right uh, at the door right through there. If you have any questions for me, uh, I will be here and glad to, to answer those questions. Uh, if you happen to be viewing online, 
Uh, my email address is uh, going to be on the screen. So I guess all I can finish with is saying that I know that you're going to have a comforting, enjoyable, no ill, very good day. Thank you.